Good morning once again, everybody. If you would, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. It's been a little bit since we were last there. Uh, We had kind of a special message uh, last week. So in the last message from Revelation chapter 6, we looked at the opening eight verses. Uh, There Jesus, having been found the only one who was worthy, has begun to break open the seals on the scroll. And in the opening verses, the first four seals were broken, releasing the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so today we will pick up right where we left off in verse 9. So with that, we will go to verse 9, and I will read through to the end of the chapter. Revelation 6, verse 9 and following, the Word of God says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. Uh, these words, quite frankly, I think can, can be somewhat jarring to our ears, Father. And we pray for the help of your Spirit this day, the very Spirit that inspired the writing of these words, that that Spirit would prepare our hearts and our minds to hear them, and that we might be convicted of the truth of these words, uh, and hear and and do them, and be changed by them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as we saw here in verse 9, the fifth seal has now been broken, and with that, John sees the souls of the martyrs under the altar. Um, Now, just to kind of place this a little bit here, Uh, We've talked several times about different views of how Revelation is arranged and what time frame possibly they speak to. So I just wanted to note here, uh, for those who hold the view of a pre-tribulational rapture, they would see this as essentially uh, sequential. And the souls that are under the altar here, since we are told explicitly they are souls and they do not have glorified bodies, these would be what we would call tribulation saints, okay? For those who hold to a post-tribulation rapture, they would just see this more or less as a reference to martyrs in general throughout the church age. Uh, I just want to make that point just for clarity, but at the same time I can tell you, no matter which view we hold, the take-homes, if you will, or what we take away from these verses is the same regardless. And... I know I keep saying that, and that's one of the things that I think is so awesome about this book, is uh, even though we may find Revelation to be 
a difficult book to, to understand, quote unquote. Uh, the real clear take home messages, I think, are very clear, uh, regardless of how else we interpret different pieces of the book. Uh, so just another thing that we can take comfort in. So these are martyrs, and the word martyr actually comes from a Greek word for witness. Um, that is what uh, the word martyr means, ultimately, is witness. Uh, martyrs witness to what they believe, not only with their lips, but also through deed, to the point of being willing to give up their very lives for the sake of what they believe. <clears throat> uh, martyrs throughout the ages have shown that their faith, particularly the object or focus of their faith, the Lord Jesus Christ is worth much more than even life itself. Uh, it is incredible testimony when rather than recant or renounce their faith in the Lord Jesus, somebody is willing to take a stand and say, no, go ahead and kill me if you must. I will not give up my faith in Christ. Uh, that makes a martyr's testimony extremely powerful, not only to the unbelieving world, but also to uh, other believers as well. Uh, it is a testimony to a very strong faith. Uh, even in the early church, it was widely held that nobody had the strength or the power in themselves to be a martyr. That was something that God had to gift you through his grace and the Holy Spirit had to empower you to be willing um, to withstand uh, the threat of death. I would say probably the most powerful uh, testimony when it comes to martyrdom comes through the apostles themselves, uh, of whom the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, uh, was one. Uh, John was the only apostle who was not martyred but he was heavily persecuted. And in fact, as he wrote the book of Revelation, uh, it is said that he is on the island of Patmos. He was exiled because of his faith. And he actually tells us uh, that he was there in chapter 1 because of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. So it was his faith in Christ and for preaching Christ that as punishment he had been sent to Patmos, uh, which was, we can kind of think of it as like a prison island, uh, not a real pleasant place to be. The reason why I say this is particularly powerful in the case of the apostles is they were eyewitnesses. They were eyewitnesses uh, to Christ himself. They lived with Jesus. They lived with him during his earthly ministry. They witnessed his suffering and death, and they witnessed his resurrection. Um, the reason why this is so important is there's an old saying that says, liars make poor martyrs. Uh, in other words, the apostles were in position to know the truth about Jesus Christ. And in knowing that truth, they were willing to suffer and to face whatever consequences came along. And according to church tradition, every single one of the apostles, except for the apostle John, was martyred for their faith. And when we consider the fact that they were there, they saw the empty tomb, they would have known if any of this was made up, that becomes an incredibly powerful witness. Yes, people are martyred for their faith. Yes, people face death for what they believe to be true, but nobody wants to be martyred for something that they know is false, okay? And I just wanted to bring that point up here, that it is very powerful testimony, particularly in the case of the apostles, that they were all willing to suffer and be martyred. <clears throat> in John's vision, he says here that he sees the souls under the altar, which really kind of sticks out here, and I think this has very important significance to it. Under the Old Testament sacrificial system, when a sacrifice was uh, offered, its blood was poured out at the base of the altar. And so what we have here is actually a reference back to the Old Testament. And 
In so, our mind is immediately brought to the idea here of sacrifice. That these are people that lived and were willing to die and were willing to give everything as a sacrifice in service to the Lord Jesus. And that is the significance here of the statement that the souls were under the altar. And in particular, if we go back to Old Testament books such as Leviticus chapter 4, Leviticus chapter 4 over and over and over again says that the blood is to be poured out at the base of the altar. And so that's where uh, this idea comes from. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us to be living sacrifices to God. But sometimes that sacrifice involves giving it all uh, as a testimony to the fact that Jesus is more valuable than anything else that we have here on earth, including the life that we have here to live. Uh, and Christians over the centuries have made this sacrifice again and again and again. And it is not something that used to happen it is something that continues to happen on a daily basis all around the world at, quite frankly, an astonishing rate. So it's not just something that we think about when we think about history. This is current events as well. It's just that our media doesn't tend to really pay much attention to stories, so we rarely, in the mainstream media, hear very much about it at all. We are told the reason why these had been slain was for the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. Uh, and ultimately, as I began to think about it a bit, I realized not only is this almost verbatim the reason that John gives us that he is on the island of Patmos, but ultimately this is the reason anyone ever really becomes a Christian martyr is because they are so convicted of the truth of God's word and the truth in there contained about Christ that they are held absolutely captive to the word of God. They believe what God has said and they are absolutely unwilling to bend on it even to the point of being brought to death. I think of the church father Polycarp uh, who was told before his execution by the proconsul and you actually get the picture here. The proconsul uh, does not want to put this old man Polycarp to death. You really get that sense when we read the historical narrative. Um, and this comes to us from uh, historians outside of the Bible. But the story of Polycarp is nonetheless very, very powerful. And you actually get the idea the proconsul is just basically begging with Polycarp. Just do this and... Uh, you know, you can go free. And he actually tells him, reproach Christ and I will set you free. But Polycarp famously replied, 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Um, and so he is just held captive by his love of Christ. Uh, and he knows that the Lord Jesus has always been faithful to him, and he is resolute in being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. I also hear when I was reading these passages here, I think of the Bohemian reformer John Huss, mm. who refused to recant and was burned at the stake simply for holding to the word of God. And John Huss was kind of a pre-reformer, if you will, uh, he was very influential on people like Martin Luther and the other reformers that came after him. But uh, he was revolutionary, and it, it, it's kind of jarring to say this, but he was revolutionary in the sense that he went back to the Word of God, put church tradition and what the Pope had to say to the side, and was absolutely focused on what the Bible had to say as the basis for all of his faith and practice. And that got him in very much trouble with the church to the point where he was tried, convicted, and then literally burned at the stake. Uh, going on to verse 10 here, I just want to reread verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who 
who dwell on the earth. So right off the bat here, I want to address the 4,000-pound the 4, scarlet elephant in the room, which is we have here the people of God who are crying out for vengeance against those who have persecuted and killed them. And quite frankly, this can be uh, fall on our ears a little harshly here. Uh, John Haas, for example, before his execution prayed, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. That is much more in line, I think, with what we are used to hearing. Um, for example, Jesus himself, as he was dying on the cross, said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So even as Jesus was dying on the cross, he was speaking out in forgiveness and mercy towards those that were responsible for his death. This is the same Jesus that tells us in Matthew 5, 44 and 45, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So there is common grace or undeserved favor that God shows to all people, to the undeserving. Uh, and the undeserving refers to everyone, because of course we are all sinners, we all have a sin nature, and nobody deserves anything but justice and judgment. But in his mercy and in his grace, God shows favor to those who are undeserving. There are people who get up every day and blaspheme God again and again, and they are not instantly incinerated. And I used to be one of those people. Um, and that's the take home here, is that each and every unredeemed sinner, uh, it, it's not an us versus them problem, it's a we. Uh, because we are only God's children by the grace of God and by the undeserved favor that he has shown to us. Not only are people not instantly incinerated, but they may have a beautiful and loving family, uh, a comfortable life, meaning they have food and shelter, uh, or any other of a million different ways that despite the fact uh, that they may blaspheme God and they may not be for God or want Him in their thinking, God, despite that, still continues to show them a common grace uh, that He gives to all people. And Jesus is making the point here that we should be like our Father in heaven and act likewise. And this is one of the big themes that I see in the Gospel of John, for example, where the children the sons and the children of the Father do like their Father does. And that is our call here. Because God treats people in this way, uh, we are also called to act like our Heavenly Father and also uh, be kind to our enemies and things that come very, very difficult by our fallen human natures. Things that we must rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to assist us with because they do not come naturally to us. But uh, we are to be like our Heavenly Father and to bless those who curse us. <clears throat> in fact, God is so amazingly gracious to sinners in general that many just come to expect it or even demand it. Uh, and that's, that's a thing, uh, actually. I mean, when I said that we can go about and be blasphemers of God and sin day after day after day and we're not immediately incinerated, that sounds harsh. But the only reason that it sounds harsh is because God doesn't do that. He's so gracious that he forgives and he allows these things to go on, hoping that people will eventually come to repentance. Uh, I'm very fond of an illustration that R.C. Sproul used years ago uh, because he used to teach in a college and he was talking about this one particular class where the first day of class they would go all through the syllabus and he would make very, very clear what the expectation for the class was. And so 
at the first day of every month they had a five page paper that was due that was to be passed in on a on a known date that was made known before the class even started and he said it was amazing to him but despite the clarity of saying this paper is due and if I don't get it then it's a zero he said people would show up and on that first day five people didn't have their paper done and so RC said okay well I will grant you a couple extra days and then you can give me the paper and so he said the next month went by and the next paper was due and all of a sudden there's ten people that don't have their papers due and so the next month came around and on the final installment their last paper when that was due 15 people didn't have their papers done and he went around the room and took names zero 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 and he said people are like wait a second that's not fair and he it, it paints a very important picture here because because he had shown people grace throughout the class at the end of the class when he then gave people justice he gave them the zeros people's immediate reaction was to cry out that's not fair when actually what was not fair was for him to show them the grace in the first place because he did not give them what they deserved he gave them rather the kindness to give them a couple extra days to get their paper done and of course this is just a mini illustra illustration of what actually happens in the world and furthermore a lot of people take the take the fact that nothing happens to them immediately in general as a fact that God doesn't as a sign of the fact that God doesn't exist at all when in reality it is simply God being graceful towards sinners and not judging them immediately for the for the as a consequence of their sin uh, so just something there for us uh, to keep in mind as well so back to verse 10 here and the focus here of the potential difficulty that we may find with people calling out for vengeance on their enemies uh, I think with proper balance uh, there is tension for the biblically minded believer here uh, on the one hand it is perfectly right and proper for us to want God to be vindicated uh, for want for us to want every need to bow to Christ to want the creation that has been so marred by sin to be corrected for all that is wrong to be made right but at the same time we want to see people come to the truth about Christ we want to see people come to faith and we want to see people be saved and I can tell you this I think in our fallenness uh, the safe default position is to absolutely focus on the wanting people to come to Christ and be saved. We have to remember that these martyrs, they are in heaven. So they are no longer under the same sinful constraints that we are. If they are calling out for vengeance, for those who are refusing ultimately to come to faith and repent, then they have much more pure motives than we would find for ourselves here while we are still in our earthly bodies and still constrained by a sin nature so there is a I believe a proper tension here uh, in the text between the right and proper punishment of the wicked and of course wanting people to come to faith and be saved <clears throat> so the important thing here is not to see a contradiction between what we read here and what we may see other places in Scripture. Uh, to be, for God to judge the wicked is simply justice. It is the right thing for him to do. Second Thessalonians 1, 4 and following reads, As a result, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God, for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you indeed are suffering. For after, it all, after all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These people will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So again here, we must keep in mind, uh, it is only just the right thing for God to do to judge those who refuse to repent um, and will not the judge of all the earth do right. Of course he will. Uh, he is God and he cannot do anything but the right thing. But we have to remember here that the gospel is available. The good news is there for all who will repent of their sin and turn to Christ in faith, they will be saved, as scripture makes abundantly clear to us. Just like everything else, as stated in the book of Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. So there is a time and the time is right now for people to turn to Christ in faith and be saved. But it is a limited time opportunity. And one day the door will close, the Lord Jesus will return in judgment, and then it will be too late uh, for people to be saved. Those who dwell on the earth here in the text is actually used here as a technical term referring to the wicked and unbelieving. So when we, re when we read here, those who dwell on the earth, this is not just a general statement uh, referring to every person who lives on earth, but actually is being used specifically to speak to um, the wicked and unbelieving. So just a, a little note there on that. And the martyrs here are crying out, how long? Uh, this is important. Notice they are not asking, will you? Or are you going to, but how long? That is the question. How long before uh, the Lord takes vengeance on those who have afflicted the people of God? The question is not if God is going to vindicate his people and ju judge the wicked. It is when. Uh, I think this is very powerfully uh, illustrated here in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And I've quoted this before, but I feel compelled to do it again because I think this is an illustration of things that are very important for us to keep in mind. The text they are referring to Jesus says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor, and he sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. Now he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is an amazing text to me. Jesus goes up, he takes the roll of, of Isaiah, he opens it up, finds the place, and then he reads a section of scripture that is a prophecy about himself and why he came. And then while everybody, you can almost picture this, or at least I can in my head, Everybody's just intently staring at him, like waiting. And then he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Because it, he's saying it's in reference to me. This is why I am here. This is why I have come, is to proclaim this uh, to you. Uh, and just as amazing to me here is what Jesus does not say. Because Jesus, when he reads this text to them, he actually stops right in the middle of a sentence. And this is where he stops. This is what he does not say to them at that time. <clears throat> because he stops at a section that says, To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. 
Now Jesus stops before he gets to that, that part because during his incarnation, he was not here for that purpose. During his incarnation, he was here to proclaim the gospel, uh, to present the good news. And then he, he was here ultimately to pay the cost for our sin. But, though he came then to seek and to save the lost, and Jesus also said, I came not to, to judge the world, but to save the world, uh, Scripture also makes abundantly clear he will return for the purpose of judgment. <clears throat> and when he does come and return in judgment, as I said, that door of opportunity will finally close. And at that time, the right thing, the just thing, is for God to judge the wicked. Vengeance, Scripture tells us over and over again, belongs to God, not to us. Uh, we want it to belong to us sometimes, uh, but Scripture makes this clear. Romans 12, uh, verses 18 and 19 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So God is the only one who can properly distribute retribution. Uh, as human beings, we are simply right to fail when it comes to uh, trying to uh, take vengeance on people that we feel have wronged us in some way. Uh, we don't have it in our nature to go about it at all properly. Uh, when we feel like we've been wronged, we tend to immediately get angry, and then we're immediately trying to figure out how we can pay someone back. Uh, the problem is, is, as human beings, we'll start to roll our pride into it. Uh, we don't have all the information. We are not omniscient like God is. Uh, and then we go shooting at the hip, and then we're going to mess it all up. And it is simply not for us to take vengeance on people. Uh, as I said, it is one of those things that sometimes is very, very hard to do, particularly when someone we love has been wronged. I think that's a particularly difficult time. We want to lash out at people, mm -hmm. and we want to do what our version of making things right is. But Scripture makes it plain that is not our area. That is God's area. God is omniscient. He has all of the information, and he has the character to precisely do what will be exactly right. Uh, it is a capability that we simply uh, do not have. Looking at verse 11. Also, one other point that is extremely important here in this text before I move on is if we look at and we see what is being appealed to, uh, the martyrs say, O Lord, holy and true. So they are appealing to the holiness and the righteousness of God in dealing with this situation. And that is precisely right. And that is precisely why, as I, as I said, God is uniquely equipped to uh, execute justice because he has the capability and the perfect righteousness to go about it in the proper fashion. Looking at verse 11, And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. So here we see each martyr is given a white robe, a symbol of righteousness. And this was actually the promise to, uh, given to the church at Sardis in chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, the promise that those who overcome would receive, they would walk in white. Uh, so these here are those who have attained the promise. They will be dressed in white. They are giving a white robe. And by their faith, they have made it home. They are now in heaven, as promised. And now the call here is for their continued patience until their number is completed. 
There are more to be saved, and there are more to come that will meet a similar fate to theirs, those whose testimony will come through the laying down of their very lives for their faith in the Lord Jesus. And immediately what comes to mind here is the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, there is a book we are told here in, Re in Revelation that contains the names of all those who will be saved. And what we see here is a playing of that out. We see that they have to be patient for a little while longer until God's purposes are completely fulfilled. Uh, it can seem sometimes like God is inactive, like perhaps he ignores the cries of his people, but this, as scripture makes it plain to us, is not the case. Oftentimes, this is simply the patience of God and God simply carrying out his plans. The Apostle Peter reminds uh, us of this in 2 Peter uh, 3, 8 and following. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So we have to remember here that it's God's plan and God's purposes. And yes, to us, it may seem like the wheels are turning very, very slowly. In fact, when we look uh, at the time since the death of Christ, it's been nearly 2,000 years. Uh, but Peter reminds us here that not to count this as slowness or slackness, uh, like we might in some kind of a human sense, but to rather be reminded that this is God's patience, because God has a purpose and a plan, and he is waiting for others to come to repentance. This is actually a sign here of God's mercy in his grace. Every day that God holds off the day of judgment for the world is another day for an unbeliever, even a persecutor and a killer of Christians, to repent, to do an about face, and then come to faith in Christ. And then they can walk into the kingdom and become a child of God just like everyone else. And that is God's amazing grace in the promise of the gospel. That no matter who we are, no matter what we may be guilty of, that through faith in Christ all can be made right and we can be restored in relationship to God. Uh, that we don't have to be like those who are reserved for eternal fire and separation from God forever if we will simply acknowledge our sin and turn to Christ in faith. Uh, everyone can be saved. And that is amazing grace. And let's close with that. Father, we thank you for this word. Um, Father, even, even in these sections that speak about judgment, uh, I am overwhelmed in thinking about your grace. The patience that you show towards a sinful world, uh, simply asking them to come to you in faith, to turn away from their sin, and that we can be saved. And Father, uh, have us be convicted of these words. Um, as times continually grow darker, Father, uh, bring these words to our mind often. Uh, have us count the cost. Have us count the potential cost of our faith in Christ. Are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to, to do what is asked of us uh, to stick to our faith in Christ? And Father, we thank you for your gift of your Son. Uh, may we go forth and share the good news of this promise with an unbelieving world. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. So I thank you, and I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday. Anybody wants to fill shoe boxes? There's still some empties. And I'm told there's cookies up here. <coughs> so please come help yourself. Thank you.